Hey, welcome to Pass Ponds. Today's video is going to be covering the A3, also known as the Samish variation of the Nimzo Indian defense. This arises from the move order D4, NF6, E4, E6, that's not E6, E6, Knight C3, Bishop B4, and A3. So this is very, very forcing. It's a very forcing line. It's sort of uncommon, but you will probably see about 10 to 15% of the time, depending on what rating range you're in. And it's something that you have to know how to play against. So in this situation, since we brought the bishop out to b4, there's really no need for us to retreat because otherwise it defeats the whole purpose of actually developing this bishop here. So we're going to take this knight. Now we've doubled white spawn structure and now there are a bunch of moves you can play here. I'm going to be recommending one line that I believe is the absolute best. It's a line that is played very rarely. So you're definitely going to catch your opponent off guard. And it's also going to be one of the best lines that you can play. b6. So b6 is pretty rare because usually you're going to play d5 or c5 or even just castle. But b6 allows the development of this bishop to a6 and followed by knight c6 and a5. So since these pawns are doubled and this pawn on c4 is quite weak, your goal is going to be to eliminate it by placing all of your pieces in accordance uh, with this pawn to be able to capture it. So obviously this knight is going to a5, this bishop's to a6, and they're both going to be starting at this pawn. So your opponent's most likely going to play f3. Now there are a bunch of other moves that we're going to mention here. But after f3, knight c6, and the reason for f3 is that it's the most popular move and is going to get followed with e4. White basically seeks uh, compensation from weakening his kingside pawn structure with the move f3 in the fact that after e4, white's going to have a very strong and large center. So after knight c6, we're going to get e4. If e4 doesn't happen, then there's no point in playing f3. Knight a5 and bishop d3. If other moves happen, like let's say bishop e3, that's entirely possible as well. I mean, a bunch of things can happen here. But bishop d3 is the most kind of forcing and more important line because let's say bishop e3, we can already play bishop a6 and it's going to be extremely difficult to keep a hold of this pawn for uh, white here. But bishop d3, we're going to play bishop a6, queen e2, the only move that hangs on to the pawn because otherwise, let's say any other developing move would allow us to capture the pawn. And we follow up with c5. So we want to prevent the pawn from being pushed. Now, if instead of queen e2, white chooses to push the pawn anyway, here we have a very interesting move in capturing this bishop. Obviously, queen recaptures back. And then we're just going to be slightly better in the fact that after these captures occur, white spawns are once again doubled. And we can even play knight b3 and just force this rook to move and then recapture the spawn and be completely fine. So, obviously, most of the time that's not going to happen. You're going to get queen e2. And at this point, you play c5, which is a multi purpose move. Not only does it blockade the pawn, it also offers this kind of pawn break, which is used to disrupt the center because if we don't do this we're going to be at a constant space disadvantage white center is quite strong so it's important to create pawn breaks wherever possible especially in d5 or d4 openings c5 is a very very common theme in, in almost every single d4 opening just because it's one of your best pawn breaks available most likely you're going to face e5 there's really no other good move you're going to go back to g8 so g8 seems quite passive but these pawns are now overextended and it opens up the f5 square for your knight so you're going to play 97, 9 of 5 very shortly, and you're just going to be uh, very, very comfortable. Bishop e3, take the spawn. Uh, the reason that this happened is because rook c8 is creating an opening for this file. Now, keep in mind that we are following a game right now. Uh, the thing is, I'm not going to be showing you guys the entire game and all of the moves within it, just because it isn't really relevant to our study. I'm just going to show you small bits and segments that I feel like are important because they will teach you uh, necessary ideas and key concepts and then you're going to be able to integrate them whenever you face them in your own games rook c1 d5 so this is where we kind of split off d5 is a mistake this is what was played in the game it's a mistake because it's not a really good move what came afterwards was en passant and if you allow your opponent to play en passant you've kind of conceded the moral victory to your opponent and so we want to avoid that as much as possible and instead the move knight e7 is a lot better so the reason that 97 is better is because, once again, we're planning to play knight f5, and I'm going to explain how this sort of move works out. Now, knight h3, there's no theory in this position, absolutely none. I don't think a game has ever reached this specific position. Obviously, your opponent can play anything else, but given the idea that they play in just a regular developing move, we can play knight f5. So knight f5 looks weird because it looks like this bishop takes and then you ruin your pawn structure. But what we now notice is that this pawn is no longer defendable. So let's say your opponent plays knight f4, you can castle. The spawn is not going anywhere. It cannot be pushed because then white just loses a queen. And so let's say white castles here. Now you can just take your free pawn. It looks like you might be winning an exchange, but knight d3 stops that. However, you're still in an excellent position. You're up a free pawn. Uh, you're going to play d6. And while your opponent fights really hard to recapture their lost pawn, 
you're just going to start pushing these pawns up and you're going to create a fast pawn and you're just going to win the game. So this position isn't anything you should be worried about. Uh, as the eval bar suggests, this is great for black and you're going to easily be able to convert and create an advantage out of this position. Now, what happens if your opponent chooses to not take this knight with their bishop and let's say they just castle? Um, in that case, I mean, this bishop is free for the taking. Obviously, the opponent's setup might be a little bit different, in which case you have to figure those moves out on your own. If the bishop wasn't on e3, for example, that would mean that this pawn is free for the taking. So you're going to have to adapt. It's very unlikely that you're going to face this very, very specific move order. But this is just to illustrate the sort of ideas you might be able to employ in your own games. So after this capture, once again, this pawn is completely free. And now you didn't even have to ruin your pawn structure. You're just in a great position and up a pawn. You're going to once again play d6. The ideas are absolutely the same. And you should be good. So that covers everything to do with f3. Now let's take a look at some of the different moves. So another quite popular move is e3. It doesn't really quite serve that many purposes. It's quite passive, yet it is also quite solid. The reason it's passive is because it blocks in this dark square bishop, essentially neutralizing it completely. But, you know, it is very much playable. Knight e6, d5. So this is not the main move. The main move is just developing this bishop normally, in which case you still employ the same ideas with knight e5 and bishop a6. Everything I just showed you, you can employ exactly the same way in this line except that you don't even have to worry about that strong of a center from your opponent, given that they didn't play f3 and e4. So this is a very, very easy line to play against. Now, because I already showed you guys how to play against this, there's no point in me repeating the exact same thing. Let's take a look at some other moves that your opponent can play, such as d5. So d5 looks very aggressive, and for good reason. If you take the spawn and then you play knight a5, why is actually doing quite good. They can play c4 and solidify and just have an excellent center here. Uh, so instead of that, we're just going to play knight a5 right away. There's no point in us taking the spawn if we don't have to. Um, if the spawn capture occurs, you can recapture back. If this queen takes, you don't have to castle. And this might look a little bit ugly, but I guarantee you, this is very, very good for black. So the reason for that is, well, we've traded off the major pieces. What is white going to attack us with? The bishops that they haven't developed yet, or the knight that is on the opposite end of the board? Probably not, right? So this king is quite safe, actually, in the center. In the future, you could go to e7, or you could even play c5 and king f7. So let's say bishop d3, c5, bishop a6. We're trying for the same plan again. Uh, if we place this knight on a5, there's really no reason for it to be here other than to support the capture of the c4 pawn. So this is absolutely our main plan. You can play king e7 here, or you can just take this free pawn either way. There's really no rush since white cannot defend this pawn. But once you've traded off these pawns, you're completely winning. This pawn is about to fall because you've got two knights attacking it. And you're just in a superior, much, much better position. Now, if we take a look at what happens instead of this capture, let's say your opponent tries for d6 for some reason in an attempt to, uh, let's say, ruin your pawn structure and then go here, thinking that this is scary. Somehow, it's not. You play bishop a6. Yes, you cannot castle temporarily, but this queen's not going to stay here for a long time. a4, there's really not much your opponent can do. Straight these pieces off. Once again, this pawn cannot be defended. If the queen decides to move back, then you could easily castle, and then why would just waste a tempo moving the queen back and forth? Queen f4, for example, d5, excellent position. You're more developed, you have better piece placement, and you're up a pawn. What more could you ask for? Now, what if your opponent plays something more reasonable, such as knight f3? In this case, you can still fall off with bishop a6. You're probably going to defend with knight d2, defending the pawn. And what you might notice is that throughout this whole variation, I've just been presenting you guys with the same idea of knight a5 and bishop a6 attacking the c4 pawn. It might seem like quite an insignificant idea given that you're only pursuing one singular pawn, but the position you get out of winning this pawn gives you a huge advantage, huge initiative, and that one extra pawn is more than enough to assist you in creating a pass pawn along the b and a files and just creating a new queen. So there's no need to reinvent the wheel. We don't need to go over like hundreds of different moves of theory where we can just play one simple idea that gives us a good solid advantage so from here the gameplay is really simple just castle there's no theory in this position so i'm not really gonna be able to show you guys much and then you're gonna play d6 or even c6 and you can just trade these pawns off however you wish to ideally you want to not trade this pawn off so you can win this pawn in the future these pieces are very much restricted because the moment one of them moves this pawn becomes a hanging pawn and you're going to be able to capture it that really covers everything to do with e3. Now let's take a look at bishop g5. So bishop g5 is an interesting idea. Bends the knight to the queen, but it really 
is quite strange because we just play h6 and kick this bishop out. If this bishop trade occurs, of course, you're very happy. You take with the queen and you just developed your queen. You're going to castle and then you can play the exact same thing like we've already mentioned with bishop a6, knight c6, and knight a5. You should be quite good from there. Now, if this bishop moves back, our ideas become quite different. We're going to play d6. The reason for d6 will become evident later on. Now that this bishop is quite annoying, we're going to want to kick it away and neutralize as much as possible. So most likely, this bishop is going to g3. It's going to be staring into these pawns. And now that we've played d6, this bishop is going to be no more than just useless. Knight f3 and bishop b7. So we don't want to play bishop a6 now because our ideas are structurally different. We are not going to play knight c6 and knight a5. So instead, we're going to play bishop b7 and play along this diagonal. Uh, let's say e3, g5, send this bishop out and jump this knight into e4. This both attacks the bishop and this pawn. And so after, let's say, queen c2, now, once again, we see the reason for d6. If we develop this knight to c6, we would simply blunder a knight. And so ideally, instead of blocking in this bishop and blundering our knight, we now have a very nice d7 square uh, for this knight. Bishop d3 attacks the knight. We're going to play f5. Now we're playing ultra aggressively along this king side. Um, if this king happens to castle king side, then it's going to be good knight. We're going to play queen e7. This opens up the idea of castling this king. And then we can just trade some pieces off and start pushing these pawns very soon. So after we've castled, we've secured our king safety. These pawns are super advanced. All we're going to have to do is play h5, h4, g4, and either g3 or h3, uh, depending on what sort of plan you're going for. And white's going to be significantly worse in this position. We have an extremely strong bishop on b7 now, which targets this king, obviously. This queen is ready to jump in at any moment. This rook can be developed to g8, or whichever square I would like to go to. And you're just going to be much, much better. Now, of course, your opponent has the opportunity to castle uh, queenside. In which case, you're still going to push these pawns since they're already very advanced. And you're just going to play based on the advantage that you have on uh, the king side. So you're going to push these pawns going to create some sort of weaknesses, induce weaknesses, you're going to definitely have more space. I mean, you already have a significant space advantage over your opponent. And so you're going to just be able to exploit that and build onwards. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this sums up everything I wanted to show you for the Nimzo Indian Samish variation. I hope you guys found this video useful. And if you did, please consider checking out a video to my left. As always, thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you in a future video.